In this episode, we'll be talking about how to work effectively as a service designer, being part of a team with remote collaborators. We'll talk about why emotional intelligence is still underrated in the workplace and what you can do about it. And we'll talk about what is the best way to democratize service design and involve other people without oversimplifying it or turning it into a recipe. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. I'm Jacqueline and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you do more work that makes you proud by designing and delivering services that have a positive impact on people and are good for business. My guest in this episode is an absolute wine lover. She started out in the music industry, building websites for composers, and now she's a service designer at Shopify. Her name is Jacqueline Ryu. Jacqueline has a super interesting perspective on service design as she's part of a company that has a high emphasis on rapid growth. And that brings some interesting challenges for a service designer. One of these challenges is how to explain service design to all the people around you. And if you are struggling with the same challenge, check out the free training that I've got for you over here, which will help you to explain service design in plain English without confusing people. And if this is your first time here on this channel, welcome. And I'd love to have you to subscribe and click that bell icon. So you'll be notified when new videos are out and that's at least once a week. So that's all for the introduction. And now let's quickly jump into the interview with Jacqueline. Welcome to the show, Jacqueline. Hi, Mark. (laughs) Nice (laughs) to have you on. Um, For the people who don't know who you are, could you give like a super brief introduction? Sure. Uh, So I currently work at Shopify Plus, which is the enterprise side of Shopify. So we work with um, sort of the larger GMV, um, gross merchandising volume, I believe. They'd probably not, I, yeah, <laughs> so I got that right. Um, anyway, so the larger GMV merchants on our platform, um, and we continue to grow up market there. Um, but yeah, so I work, um, I was the first service designer that they hired, and, um, and so I'm kind of helping them scale that in-house, and we'll talk more about that. Um, and then uh, I've worked in the financial services industry doing service design at Fannie Mae and Capital One, and then was uh, in the music industry for a while before that. Hmm. Hmm. Quite an interesting transition. Uh, so <laughs> yes. at Shopify right now as the first service designer. Uh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, it, it's funny, you know, as I started, I started meeting more and more people who were kind of applying service design methods and service design thinking, but didn't have the formal title of service design. So that, that, they've all kind yeah. of come out of the woodworks. Yeah. That, that will be a new title for my show. Like uh, I was doing service design for 20 years without knowing that it was called that way. It's like, totally, it seems yeah. it seems to be the thing in the industry. Talking about yeah. service design, um, when did you get introduced to the term for the first time? Uh, so um, it's funny. Uh, I was listening to the recent episode with Greg, and uh, and I realized that we'll have a sh- similar story, which is uh, uh, Jamin will feel very proud of himself. Jamin <laughs> Hackman and Greg like Luffy yeah. for the people who aren't familiar with that. <laughs> yeah. So um, so when I it's funny. So I had I had uh, been accepted to Carnegie Mellon to do my graduate um, degree in design, and I had um, and I had, I said I was going to go, and I was all ready to go to to Pittsburgh and do do my master's there. And then I got an offer uh, from Capital One to join their design team. And I was kind of on the fence. You know, I had come from music, and so I wasn't really keen on, I didn't know much about financial services other than being someone who had to learn a lot about finance over the years myself. Um, But then I heard about the the acquisition of Adaptive Path, and that kind of changed things because when I was looking at Carnegie Mellon, Adaptive Path was one of the places I would have wanted to intern or to work at. And, um, and so when that happened, I was like, okay, maybe they're onto something, you know, they just acquired this really great firm. And, um, and so anyway, fast forward to, uh, when did I start November, 2014, kind of around there, um, the, uh, all the, the 20 something adaptive path folks were in DC onboarding. Um, and I had a chance, uh, to kind of meet several of them face to face. 
And very early on, um, we were on the ninth floor of our Towers Crescent building. And I remember uh, definitely Jamin was there. I'm trying to remember if Patrick Quattlebaum and Chris Risden were also there. Um, but I, again, had like, like just the good fortune of being able to learn from Adaptive Path from like day one. Hmm. And hmm. Uh, and I had been in product design kind of before that. And um, And when I... You know, when I met them and started hearing them talk about service design, I was like, oh, my God, where has this been? You know, this is exactly <laughs> what I meant to do. So, uh, cool. Yeah. cool. That, yeah. Their adaptive yeah. path has had a huge influence on the uh, <laughs> on the industry. Uh, and still a lot of people yeah. are sort of have some sort of connection with what happened. Well, yeah, what happened there? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see, you know, several folks are still within Capital One and others have moved on. Um, but I mean, some of to this day, like Maria Cordell was one of the most influential um, researchers that I met. Um, she was so meticulous, like the rigor that she applied to her, um, to the codification of her research was, is amazing. I, to this day, I tell people, I'm like, go check out Maria's work. <laughs> so, yeah. Let's, um, you've sent me uh, a few topics, of course, like we always do here on the show. <laughs> A few of them are really, really interesting. Uh, you have the question starters already becoming famous. Uh, so design show question starters. Are you ready to start? You're, you're a musician, so we're going to do jazz. <laughs> I feel like, Excited? yeah, I know. I, I, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Three, two, one. And you told me that you would surprise Ooh. yourself. <laughs> so pick one, pick a random one. And the, uh, right. oh, the, well, the topic the is called remote collaborators, by the way. Yes. Oh, yeah, for the uh, the folks on the audio. <laughs> yeah, for the folks on the okay. audio. I think that, ooh, that could throw an interesting twist. Okay, now I'm going to do this. This is the first one that came up that I think. How it can says, we? How can we? <laughs> Sorry, I'll let you read that. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. Okay. <laughs> so I think... The re one of the reasons the how can we spoke to me was because it, there's so many, uh, there are a lot of uh, frustrations, let's say, during remote remote work. Um, a large part of it is bandwidth um, and buffering. And just like when I first started at Shopify, I uh, I feel like I'd be on conference calls and it would be like, uh, 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 and I'd be like, I can't hear what you're saying. <laughs> And uh, anyway, so I ended up getting a new, a new cable installed to my house <laughs> from the cable company. I went that far to get like, I need to get that fixed. I got a Google Wi-Fi and um, and like got a bunch of mesh, set up a mesh network and kind of strengthened the Wi-Fi connection. So that was like point A. But um, to the point of remote collaboration. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, hold, yeah. hold on, Jacqueline. We need to go back three yeah. steps because uh, <laughs> okay. I'm sure that there are people watching and listening and have no clue what you mean with remote <laughs> collaboration. Sure. Give us a little bit of context. Yeah, okay. So um, let's see. So there are maybe folks who telework, which is a little different than, I mean, actually you could still remote collaborate through that. But in DC, so I live in, um, I live in Virginia, Northern Virginia, which is just outside of Washington, DC. So across the river from, from all the government stuff. Um, and a lot of folks here telework. Like it's, um, it, you can feel it in the traffic patterns, but that just means that like you work from home on a Friday or you work from home in the Monday or like in the morning and then you go to work uh, later in the day, but it's quite flexible and you're finding a bit, you know, it, it's definitely something that people are valuing, I think more to have that flexibility, myself included, um, that it's not so much about, you know, when you work, but what you're able to produce and, and how you work with folks. Um, I once had a manager tell me, <laughs> it's like, I don't care if you work out of a phone booth, you know, I just care about you getting your work done. <laughs> it's funny. I was like, where is a phone booth? These yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, so remote collaboration, uh, for myself. So, um, so Shopify in particular is interesting because all of our, well, I'd say the majority of our frontline staff. So our merchant success managers who are kind of like account managers that work on the front lines to support our, um, our enterprise merchants. We have uh, gurus, which are our support team. Um, so they connect via uh, video chat, text, uh, email, uh, and phone. Um, and then we've got our sales reps that are distributed. Uh, some of them are co-located in some of our offices, but um, the sales reps, and um, again, they're usually on their phone um, or they'll do video or they'll go on site. Uh, but the fact that more than half of Shopify's um, employee base is distributed around the world. So we have offices or we have employees 
uh, in North America, Australia, New Zealand, mm. Uh, mm. England, Germany. Um, uh, I feel like, I don't know if we're in South Africa yet, but we've mm. got uh, Singapore, Japan, like they're just like, we're everywhere. <laughs> so it's, um, so one of the, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. no, and, and, and sort of, um, I, I'm really curious about the implications for a service designer because uh, one of the things uh, I think that is inherently part of service design is collaboration, like mm -hmm. workshops and being around yeah. people. What, what's your experience with that? How does that work for a service designer? Yeah, so um, <laughs> it's funny because we're in this, I, I, I'm sure like others who are listening have caught wind of this focus on outcomes you know, and really trying to orient the work that we're doing. And it's, it should have always been that way. But for this period of time, as services I was emerging, it was a lot about the artifacts and people, you know, uh, when I was at Fannie Mae, we had a lot of external consultants who would come on board for these engagements and they would create journey maps after journey map after journey map and, uh, or service blueprints and like a miscellany of personas. And they, their engagement went off and end after they delivered the artifact. And um, so, you know, I can go into that um, later or if anyone wants to talk about that. <laughs> but it, there's, um, it's, it, it, that was interesting in and of itself and seeing what happens when you have a bunch of different um, external con consultants all working for different accountable executives within an organization and there not being any sort of central, um, you know, place that they all kind of engage or collaborate. And so you had all types of different personas and different names and like different formats and different color schemes. Mm, and, mm, um, mm. and like all of these artifacts ended up creating a very fragmented experience uh, for our customers uh, because they were done in silos, which, um, you know, is a word that I'm yeah, sure we've yeah, all yeah. heard. <laughs> so, but, um, but for remote, you know, when, um, sorry, I feel like, yeah. So the outcomes bit is really thinking about, um, you know, why are we, why, why, if you want a journey map, why do you want the journey map? What is that in service of? Like, what are you trying, um, what is that going to help you understand that you may not have understood before? Um, sometimes I tell folks that the act of creating it, you know, that it's, it's really important about who you have in the room, who you're collaborating with, but sometimes the act of just, you know, putting st stickies up on a wall and moving them around and having conversations that the artifact can be a prompt for conversation and a and enable alignment an excuse yeah. to have the conversation yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah so i mean and lynn Vizard actually did a really great talk um she's a toronto service designer who's really involved in the community um she did a talk at the canadian services on conference last year in montreal um on the material of outcomes and it got us thinking about um what are outcomes you know, in service design, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. you know, so sometimes it can be about changing the narrative within the organization, getting people to talk differently and think differently. And those are less tangible. These are not things that we're creating, but these are still outcomes of, of introducing Absolutely. service design. Yeah. 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 So, uh, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> getting back to the question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> getting back to the question, I was, <laughs> so I'm really curious if I look at the nature yeah. of our work, it's really about collaboration. And then being yeah, yeah. in the same room with people to have that conversation, are you still able to achieve that, or and how, if so, how? Yeah, yeah, it's been an interesting uh, period. So I've been at Shopify for about eleven months. It'll be a year in May. Um, and um, at first, I was embedded in specific projects. So it was like, okay, we have this initiative to. Uh, to help people, um, they call it like a self-drive initiative. So help people kind of, you know, resolve things on their own and, and grow on their own. Um, and it, part of that was a strategy around growth um, and how we how can we scale, scale our, our offering. Um, but being embedded in some of these projects, it was interesting. I kept kind of, um, you know, we, we would have, we would connect remotely over, uh, we use Google Meet um, for a lot of our meetings. So we're very much involved in the G Suite ecosystem. So we use Google Docs, Sheets, um, what the heck is the spreadsheet one? Oh, that's Sheets and Slides. Yeah, all, slides. That, all, yeah. <laughs> all the things. Google yeah. Star, yeah, anything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, Forms, you know, yeah. you name it. Um, uh, which is a nice, you know, step up from Fannie Mae and the the, <laughs> the very restrictive tooling I had, mm -hmm. I had access to there. But um, so one is tooling. That, I think that enables a ton, like having access to stuff. Um, I started using a program called Whimsical when I was working with these teams. Um, 
Whimsical is new. I think they have some, I've given them some feedback because I'm, I appreciate feedback. So I try to give them candy. I'm like, Hey, you're getting the benefit of uh, a design, a designer that's giving uh-huh. you feedback. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, it, uh, we had some security issues, so we couldn't keep using it, but, um, but it, it's a really beautiful UI, but it's a browser based, um, whiteboarding. Uh, so similar to mural or real time board, yeah. but it just had a beautiful, like UI, hmm. Um, hmm. but it wasn't. Uh, you couldn't open anything on a tablet or or a smartphone or mobile device. You had to use it on a desktop hmm. in the hmm. browser. Hmm. Um, and there were some issues with. I could only invite people to comment. They couldn't actually, you know, also co-edit with me, and we couldn't co-create. So that was limiting. And then I got charged a bunch of money for hmm. inviting people to a thing without knowing hmm. that I was going to get charged. <laughs> so, so I said they have some improvements, but generally, I think they're on the right track. It's beautiful. Well, what have you found, uh, if you have found, what what are the limits to mm. remote collaboration from a perspective of a service designer? Uh, a more like, part of it is actually, I think, people getting comfortable with the tools. So for a lot of the collaborators, you know, they may have just gotten comfortable using like Google Sheets or Google Docs or Evernote or whatever it is that they're using to capture things. And I look at, so there's been a a pro and a con to having an organization like Shopify where we do have access to tons of tools, whereas Fannie Mae was the complete opposite Mm -hmm. where it was like everything was was like blocked. You couldn't access any domain. Um, And so web-based tools were almost like non-existent. Um, So we actually, for that, we used Microsoft Surface Hub and we had a physical Surface Hub in our office and we had the Mural Mural, Mm -hmm. um, app kind of with the Surface Hub and we could kind of use Mural through these Surface Hubs. That was, but you had to be co-located in one of our offices to do that. You couldn't be at home. So that was a limitation. Anyway, so for Shopify, having the ability to like try out any tool you want is great, but then you find that everyone's using different tools and people get comfortable with those tools. And when you're working with, especially with folks in different countries um, where maybe a tool may have broader market penetration in that area over another. And so that's just what's more you know, readily available or more convenient or... Um, I, so I've just found the hurdle is in saying, Hey, can we all use real time board? You yeah, know? yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And like just getting them to, you know, to do that. To decide on one tool to, to work, to yeah. use as a yeah. team. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then like the oper- you know, the, op- um, operationalizing that and saying, okay, well, if this is the tool that we are going to use, how do you then level everyone up so that they all have access, um, hmm. they have the right templates, um, they have the right training, like this is the tool that we all go to. Um, and the other complication is working in a product company where a lot of folks use GitHub um, to do all their notes and to collaborate. And I'm not coming from a developer background and that's not a tool that I use, but when I propose like you know, I propose a new tool, I kind of get the like, well, we don't all want to use that because we're already using this. So <laughs> yeah. I, I think but, it's uh, a, a remote collaboration has been uh, on the show a few times. And I think it's super interesting mm. because it's not only about collaborating with team, um, with your team members. But um, for <laughs> instance, we've been using real time board to experiment with yeah. remote interviews. Um, yeah. And creating uh sort of uh, mimicking the dynamics of uh, a face-to-face interview with props on a table through real-time board. Mm. I think there's a lot we still can sort of learn in that realm anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's, I would love, right now my, the one that I'm really finding serves a purpose is real-time board. Uh, I know Mural is probably the closest competitor to that and I've used them both, but right now I'm just having fun with something new, Um, but it's, it has the ability to edit, which is huge, yeah, right? Yeah, Letting, yeah. yeah. And um, and it's easier, easy enough for people to adopt. You can have the desktop app, so you can do work offline. Mm. There's uh, there's just some key mm. details. Mm. Yeah, it's fun because on the on the service design show, we d- actually don't talk mm. that much about tooling and tools. <laughs> uh, if you are in, if yeah. you're listening or watching this and you're enjoying and would like to hear more about tools. Leave a comment, you yeah. know, we might do some special episodes because usually we don't actually talk about the practical tools. Anyway, yeah, let's yeah. keep it let's <laughs> keep it for the tooling part at this because there's more yeah, good yeah. to come. Are you ready to move on? Yes. Yeah, let's let's, all let's right, uh, all right. shift topics. On the other side of the spectrum, uh I need to there we go. Other side of the spectrum. The second topic for today is <laughs> called emotional intelligence. 
Hmm. Now, which question uh, starter? All right. Why? And now, and now, and now what's the question? All right. So why is emotional intelligence important in the workplace? Um, this is something that's very, I think, near and dear to me. Um, it's, uh, it's like, let's see, there, are, uh, we're, I think we're, we're definitely in the midst of a time when em employees care more and more, and we've always cared, but it's, for some reason now we're in this period where it's okay to care about our humanity and people being kind to us and hearing us. Um, and I was actually at the X4 Experience Management Summit in, um, in Salt Lake City, and, and Oprah was one of the keynotes, and she talked a lot about intention and and how, you know, just really her, her big point was like, you know, doing something, like knowing your intention for doing something. Um, and that for her, it was about helping people feel heard and that we all just really want to feel heard. Um, so there's, it's not just happening in the tech space, but this is happening, I think, in a lot of industries. And I think we're in, in we're in the midst of an era of, of our humanity mattering mm, <laughs> and our well-being mm, mattering. Mm. And, um, and I was, I, I, I basically, um, every day I'm on LinkedIn, just kind of reviewing my feed or I'm on go my Google feed. And that's basically where I get a lot of stuff. And, and there was one, I don't know his name, but there was this recent, um, uh, video that came up of some guy speaking and basically saying like emotional intelligence is, is if you aren't, if you don't, if you don't have, um, if you don't have regard for you know your employees and their well-being, if you don't care, if you don't kind of develop those soft skills, if you don't develop um, your ability to really hear someone and to leave your ego at the door and to be very humble and curious, um, like you're going to fall behind. Like this is a this is a period where this matters, um, and I think this comes into play in a couple areas in service design. Uh, one, first and foremost, is is uh, in order I think to be an impactful service designer, you have to enter a room with um, I, I have to say, like compassion, curiosity, and courage. Those are kind of my three. I love those three. <laughs> I love those three. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, like really, no matter who's in the room or who you're talking to, you have to, you know, that that like be curious. You know, get get curious about what they're saying. Ask questions. Really try to hear them. Uh, the compassion is really just it's a you know it's really a trying to be nice with my alliterations, but it's another. It's a synonym of like empathy and and just trying to be empathetic and really um, really care for others. Uh, and then the courage is like sometimes you you have to have the courage to stand up and to advocate for the right thing. And in some rooms with some stakeholders, that can be uh, that can be uncomfortable. And I think it takes courage to um, you know to stand up. And so I think in as a service design practitioner, it's important uh, to really model those three uh, behaviors. Um, but then as an employee. I, I, I will, it matters more to me that I work for an organization that cares. And I know that some organizations say like, you know, we're not family. We don't, we know we're not here to be family. Uh, this is a business. And if that's their DNA, like you go, you, that's do you, you know, but I heard um, the HR, um, he's like the chief community officer at Patagonia speak at this conference. And, uh, and he got a standing ovation for just talking about some of the the perks and the benefits and just how they regard how they treat their employees, and Patagonia has like a four percent um, uh, attrition rate. Like people join and they stay. Um, they have an on-site daycare center. They you know that uh, they know everyone's kids' names. Like they're like, hey, your child's taking their first steps. Like go to, go outside and go go watch them. You know. Anyway, I just think it matters. <laughs> and. Um... At the same time, you also feel that it's under undervalued, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> what's the deal <laughs> That's there? Very good point. Yeah. So, in a so there's oh, okay. So if you get a chance, or if anyone's listening, there's a podcast uh, called Startup that uh, Gimlet Media um, produces, and it was actually um, I don't know if that was the first one that they did, um, but um, uh, Bloomberg, what's his name? Yeah, I'm blanking the. The, we'll, the, we'll link to the, it down below. Yes. Yeah, we'll link to it. Okay. So basically this, this uh, podcast, uh, the, first, the first series, the first like series of, of startup was a focus on Gimlet and like their whole story of like, um, be, like getting investment money and just trying to like do like trying to brand themselves, trying to get going. I'll speed this up. The point, the takeaway there was like in the tech 
industry. And anytime you're looking at like getting investor money, uh, and it depends on the on the VC. I think that's where that's one caveat or footnote. Um, some VCs really want to invest and support in folks because they believe in what you're doing, and it's maybe not so much about growth. But t- some of the takeaway from Gimlet was like you had to show growth. You had to show like, all right, if I'm going to invest in you, I want to see your numbers. I want to see what like make this worth my while. And then that shifts to uh, if you go public to your shareholders, and the shareholders want to see growth, so they're going to stop investing. Um, and this is like, you know, just my very quick synthesis from like, you know, eight episodes. Um, and there were a lot of other takeaways. If you're starting a company, go check out the podcast. But, um, but what I started thinking about was I was like, okay, well, Shopify is a high, like a, like a, like a we call it a hyper growth, you know, tech company. They, uh, if you follow Motley Fool, they talk about how smart it is to invest in Shopify. Um, but the, the constraint is, um, we are we have pressure to grow and and that has created a culture of speed and like really hasty decision making um and i and, and the unfortunate thing is that oftentimes the things that get you know cut out of research and spending time doing ethnographic studies like going on site with our merchants and hearing them and i was like let's just get a gopro and a van and like drive out you know to a bunch of merchants spend time at their office like let's spend a week at each of them you know, and just like kind of immerse ourselves in their space and do like have lunch with folks and chat and like talk to di- people at different levels and like bring all that multimedia, like really rich qualitative data back. And let's tell a like a good, meaningful story, um, you know, that gets us out of spreadsheets and numbers and documents. Like let's bring the humanity kind of, you know, back into like um, our empathy building. And uh, so that's something I'm trying to do right now, but it's, it's where I have to convince the leadership that this is worthwhile. That okay, how, this is and how are you doing that? <laughs> so, how are you doing that? Yeah. Because <laughs> this is like uh, I think everybody in the service design field uh, recognizes this. This is mm-hmm. the um, oh the never-ending battle for short-term results versus like long-term investment, mm-hmm. right? That, that, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. How are how are you convincing people that this is worth their while? So this is actually a really good segue to the third topic. If you want to bring up the third topic, sure. I don't know. Uh, no, well, well, no, no. He, we're not bringing in the the third topic uh, just yet. Um, okay. Be, because um, one, one, maybe one final question about this one is like, yeah. what are the consequences that you see that emotional intelligence soft yeah. skills aren't valued as much as you'd like them to be uh retention uh hmm. engagement productivity uh, uh personal satisfaction fulfillment like you know we have everyone who's come every company that i've ever joined and anyone who i've worked with you know we make a decision to go work for someone else like i was doing my own consulting for a bit before i went to shopify and it was like, okay, then Shopify put this like carrot out there and it was like, come help us do service design. And I was like, oh, Shopify, you know? <laughs> and so it like, they got me, but, um, but we like, we have to like a lot of companies sell a huge promise of like, come here and do this thing and you'll get, you know, and you're kind of like the one they're dating right now. And they're giving, you know, you're like the new, you know, and then you get hired, you come on in, you're like, oh my God, chaos. And they're on to like the next, you know, person they're dating and they're like, carrot, 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 you know? And I think like we have, like, if you want to apply, this way I love, um, I love, like, I'm really interested in like the employee experience and applying, applying more and more service design to org design and, uh, and like design operations and, and really looking at the HR space. And like, it's hugely important for us to regard these end to end you know, candidate and employee experiences with the same type of attention that we do our customer experiences. Um, and so I, that's something I've had to really try to get people to think about it, you know, and, and any company I've worked for. Like, if you're going to go tell someone who works on the front lines who spent the last year and a half building a relationship with a customer, and they know that customer, that customer is inviting them to all their um, their annual meetings, they're coming on site to attend, you know, brainstorming sessions, and they're actually part of the team. And then you say, you know what, we're gonna, um, we're gonna no longer like that, we have to move that customer on to someone else or, or not, or they're, you know, for whatever reason, that, like, you've now just taken away, like the thing that may have given that employee meaning and value in their work. And, and, 
you shouldn't be shocked if you look, if like engagement is down or morale is down, like, and now th- the next customer that they're serving is getting a lesser experience. Hmm. So I think there's a, there's a big, like, we have to be, we have to draw that connection between employee experience and customer experience more. And, and especially when uh, <laughs> we start to focus on employee experience and start to understand how mm-hmm. it impacts the bottom line, because that's the direction, the thing around employee experience is going in like we're starting to understand that it's good for good employee experience yeah. is actually good for business then yeah. it starts to the puzzle <laughs> starts to fit together yeah. it, something like that yeah yeah okay. i wish that we could just say like hey let's just do what's right for the sake of being good people um but when you're in a business you have to kind of you have to look at it from both sides you have to kind of make the business case as well as um you know, as well as the... Or you just have to uh, skip the investors. That probably <laughs> saves you a lot of uh, mental, yeah, mental right. stress. Okay, you wanted yeah, to yeah. move on into the third topic uh, because the question was, how are you spreading emotional intelligence? And, mm-hmm. well, we have did a, titled this topic, Giving Away. So let's start uh, huh. Let's start our question with, with this. Ooh, there's two. Just pick one, <laughs> anyone. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Go. Uh, how far? How far? <laughs> yeah, yes. This one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well. So, what's the question? Okay, I love this. Um, so, when when is it time to give service design away? I guess. Uh, what are uh, are, we, are we giving service design away? It's so precious. Okay. We have to be so careful with it. <laughs> So this, I have to give credit to uh, Jamin for this. Um, so the notion of, he did a talk at uh, the Global Service Design Conference in Madrid a couple of years ago. Uh, and it was like, I think it was a breakthrough talk for him to talk about giving it away. Um, uh, and I think he started that conversation around what does it mean to give it away? And at the time I didn't, I, I was looking at it from more of a personal angle. Like, you know, this had been this baby that Jamin was sort of an expert in and, um, and, uh, you know, and, and he, he's very humble about it. Like if I ever told Jamin, he was like a expert in this, he just, you know, like it, even like Chris, they were all kind of the same. It was like, we're just guys like doing what we do. And, you know, um, anyway, that's a, a footnote, but, um, <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't get it then. I didn't get the notion of giving it away and what that really meant. And like, I was just like, well, if, like, okay. So you mean like other UX, other design teams, you want them to do service design? But the connection I'm starting to draw now, and this is why it's very passionate, is this is what I'm doing at Shopify, is the last 10 months I spent butting, like, beating my head against, or beating my head against the wall, where the idiom is. <laughs> um, like just kind of really, it was a really uh, frustrating engagement with some of these project teams who are, um, who their customer experience specialists. Like they came from customer experience backgrounds and and they manage a team of, um, frontline staff who are like these experts in various aspects of e-commerce and like growing your e-commerce business. So they have an army of like a thousand, you know, MSMs, we call them those merchant success managers who all have different areas of expertise. And I was hired around the same time that, uh, a director of the merchant experience was sort of hired or merchant success was hired. And it immediately was this really strange, like, I like you, you, I'm, I'm, you think of me sometimes you include me in some things and, and I'm trying to like give you recommendations and how I want to do things, but there's almost like way too many cooks in the kitchen. It's kind of like, we're all coming at it from like, well, you should do this. And okay, well, that's, that's great. But, um, but the difference was that I didn't have, like, they owned the frontline experience. Mm-hmm, like she, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. she, they have she demanded, managed yeah, the frontline yeah, yeah, yeah. team. Yeah. Totally. I was just like an internal consultant who was like, you should look at this and think of it this way. And so it felt for the longest time that I was just sort of this, like, it was a nice to have. And I was like, I can, like, there's so much more value that we can have here. Um, and one, I was, my headcount, I haven't had any headcount until this upcoming um, quarter. So I finally get to hire a couple people, which is great. Um, but up until that point, it, I wasn't, like, I was creating, um, you know, various diagrams to kind of help visualize this space, you know, to be like, okay, well, you know, and, and then and all the while it was like, there was no space for research. It was like, okay, well, we'll identify some subject matter experts internally that you can kind of meet with. And, and uh, so I was doing interviews with our frontline staff. And instead of it being focused on the research with 
frontline staff about their experience as an employee, it was like we were using them as a proxy for the customer. Um, so it was still just a hypothesis. And so I was expressing like, okay, this is not ideal. Like, let's just qualify this as, an, as a hypothesis. If you want to go make some, you know, decisions based on this, just know that this is not, you have not done research. Like, mm-hmm. this is not mm-hmm. valid. Mm-hmm. Uh, might be a great assumption, but who knows? Um, anyway, so I, uh, I was actually seeing a career coach at the time because I was kind of feeling really frustrated and demoralized. <laughs> I was like, um, and she, she said to me, she's like, you know, it sounds like you're being dragged by the horse and you need to get on the horse. And I was like, okay. and so, <laughs> and so, and so that just kind of stuck with me. And I was like, yeah. So I, I remember like coming back home and I went to my, my, my manager and I was like, listen, I'm, I'm pulling out of these two projects. This is not working. Like I, I can do so much more than this. You're getting like, these are very expensive journey maps, you know, mm, <laughs> like, mm, these are mm. not. and, um, and I was just like, okay, I, what I'm going to do is we're going to scale this. I'm going to, I'm going to effectively give it away. I'm going to turn my role into more of a coach and a facilitator and an educator. Um, and I'd like a headcount to hire another very, like very senior, like we're going to hire a staff service designer. So uh, someone who's not going to do people management, but who's going to focus on practice as a practitioner. Um, and we're going to create playbooks and worksheets and templates in all the different tools that we use. Uh, and we're going to go around and we're going to like be there as a consultant to kind of help level up our frontline staff, help them collect better insights, help them use the right tooling to capture those insights so others can leverage those insights. Um, we're going to do workshops on like, you know, to, with the project teams to help them go through the motions of creating a journey map if that's what they want to do. And Yeah. I, I've talked to Jamie and, uh, <laughs> about this, and, uh, and yeah. I, I sort of think uh, we, we understand uh, what this is about. But what comes up in my head immediately when I hear people about giving service design away or the democratizing service design stuff like yeah. that is, you know, how do we navigate the the dangers or the pitfalls of people oversimplifying it and Uh, mm. uh, productizing it basically so you know mm-hmm. oh great you've made this playbook for us just so if we follow these 10 steps uh, we'll yeah. be okay so why do we actually need you as a service designer What, what's your take on that mm. yeah I joked today with someone I was like I'm kind of you know eventually I'll be out of a job but I was like you know which I mean I don't necessarily think that's the case I'm sure over time maybe there's some level of, of um, broader strategy that I can use my skills and my strengths for, you know, but, um, but I think it, you have to, you have to put whoever you're designing for first. Like, I think I would love to see more and more organizations kind of flip the narrative and be like, okay, like, like, let's understand what it's, what's going on for our employees. If, if you're, if you're in the HR space or talent space, okay, how do you focus more on that talent experience? Not what's convenient for you, Um, and same with the customer experience. Like we internally, we, everyone talks about how great Shopify is. And I don't, and I, I do, there are some wonderful things. I don't mean to, to poo poo Shopify. <laughs> There's some great things. Um, and then they're doing good. The product is fantastic. The service I think is where we need some help. Um, but the, if we can, if I can help train folks and empower them with the right tools, uh, and the right, like understanding of how to capture, like we're talking about training our frontline staff on how to moderate conversations yeah, in a way yeah. that is less less biased yeah, um, yeah. and you know i mean i think some of it is yeah like you have to meet people where they're at like mm-hmm. if it makes sense you know sometimes you may have the best of intentions like we've had interview guides for all kinds of things and then you go off script because that's where the conversation's going and you're like oh this is really good so you have to be flexible but there is a degree of Like, I think there's still a role for service design as a, as sort of like the editor of, or the, um, the curator of the yeah, content yeah, and materials. Yeah, you know? the orchestrator. Yeah. What, what <laughs> yes, I, yeah. What, what I think where this is heading into is um, we shouldn't be saying that we're sort of giving service design away maybe, but we're, <laughs> yeah. uh, what, we, what we're doing is we're helping other people help us basically like frontline staff could be a great, yes. they're, they're yeah. great for research and other people are mm-hmm. 
great for facilitating. Uh, so they mm -hmm. there are there are people who can do bits and pieces of the to make the whole process better. But sort of, I mm -hmm. think you're right when you say service designers. The, the service designer might be the person who ties everything together, orchestrates mm -hmm. uh, stuff. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, because otherwise you're at risk of having really unreliable data um, that mm. you can't use. That's you know, and that's what we're faced mm. with now. Is we have teams that that are starting, like are kind of ad hoc doing research, and they're not able. They can't discover existing yeah. insights. They yeah. don't know where it lives. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So let's uh, um, let's go into the final question for this episode. And this final sure. question is is your opportunity to ask us a question. Is there anything on your mind that we could chew up on, think about, help you with? Hmm. Yeah. Um, so something that's personal, well, not personal. It's more just like a an ambition. Is I'm more and more I'm feeling interested in getting into the like learning and development or le learning and organizational development space or org design um, and the employee experience. And the interesting thing is you look at a lot of uh, roles and job descriptions and like requirements and it's like must have a master's degree in HR or must have an HR background or HR, HR, HR. And, and I'd love to hear from the community, like how can, how can talent teams and organizational development teams, LNOD teams start, like, like how can they bring service design into that space and like kind of broaden, you know, broaden their expectation, like broaden their mind for what a service designer could bring to that space. And like, I don't know. I just think that there's still some like traditional requirements. And I think there's still lots of opportunity to disrupt for lack of a better word. <laughs> hmm. um, like the, the employee experience and how like, how organizations function like a lot of organizations need an audit like it just gets so messy and there's so much excess and inefficiency and duplicative work and disgruntled employees and i just i i've just seen it again and again and again every place i've worked and that's why i've become so passionate about working in this space because to me it it it's it's like at the root of your ability to deliver a good exactly. customer experience yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly and, and often you know, I, I get the question, how can we deliver mm -hmm. a great customer experience if everything inside of the organization sucks, right? That's uh, yeah. and and I and yeah. I often have to say you're right. So um yeah, we should we yeah. should definitely start start winning or at least do both yeah. things at the same time. Like like just more my my it's my my um call to action for anyone who's in those positions to like open your mind to service design and, and what a service design practitioner can bring to that space. I'm sure um, there are people yeah. listening, watching yeah. right now who are, who, yeah. you know, uh, yeah, this is the person we you should be talking to. Leave a comment yeah. again. We might uh, get somebody yeah. on the episode <laughs> on the show in the, in the future. Who knows? Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Jacqueline. Thanks. Yes. Thanks so much for, for sharing <laughs> what's on your mind. Uh, and uh, yeah the things you're thinking about giving us a little bit more inspiration and uh, diverging a little bit into what service design <laughs> is. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Mark. It's been a pleasure. Um, there's always so much more to talk about. So if anyone wants to, to chat, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, you know, email or on LinkedIn or whatnot. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. So what is your biggest takeaway from this episode? Leave a comment down below. And if you know someone who might be interested in what we've just discussed, grab the link and share it with them. You're not only helping the channel to grow, but you're probably also putting a smile on somebody's face. If you're interested in the free training that I talked about on how to explain service design, check it out over here. And if this is your first time here, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Thanks so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you on the next video.